didn't rely upon jumping through people's assumptions, so assuming that they already agree with you and just kind of rah rah you into agreement with it. Um, and also tackling a topic that would be difficult to tackle, because on the one hand saying, it's not just starting from bending the stick towards saying we defend cultures that are under attack, but also saying, actually, ethnic identity is a fiction, or at least it's, 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 it's a political thing. It's not something you can actually use in an analytical sense. Restating a case for universalism uh, in a way that I found very attractive and it had a big impact, as in fact did. I realise that apart from chapter 8, which I will mention slightly, I'd read all the uh, essays when they came out. Um, and I also realised how much of what I have done and other people have done, an uh, entire generation almost actually was in dialogue with Neil's ideas, Neil's work. So, it's really uh, quite something. Um, it's also been, I mean, part of the, the concerns that Neil has addressed throughout his whole intellectual project has been, you know, like water, you know, man from heaven, or water in the desert when you're a socialist in, in Scotland in the late 1990s, around 2000s, just cutting through the, the kind of gibberish and myth-making nonsense about Scottish nationhood that was ab absolutely saturated kind of political scene has been invaluable and you see how while doing that that doesn't mean you have to be parochial actually you can look at it's very clear in this book of essays that understanding of the world through the particular political concern and place that you are um, <clears throat> unfortunately of course that understanding of the world is complete nonsense <laughs> <laughs> well not not really I mean I want to say that I agree fundamentally with Neil about especially points you making about intercapitalist competition and it's a particularly dangerous period that we're sliding into at the moment. I'd probably characterise it as something that is kind of apolar imperialism where you have um, two imperialist states, for example Russia and the United States, actually having the same ally in Syria, the, the formerly kind of anti, uh, or um, in, in quotes, terrorist group, the, the PKK, it's, um, it's Syrian armed YPG. So it's, it's a I agree with that. Um, but there might be different reasons why I kind of agree with that. And I want to maybe focus on three things. But first of all, the main, the main area I think we'll disagree on, the kind of fundamental one, which comes out most in chapter 7 and 8, are those two essays, which are, are really good, especially chapter 8, which I hadn't read before on the far right, politics of the far right. Um, and it's a disagreement about function versus generation, let's say. So Neil's spoken a lot, and at the heart of the argument he's making about nationalism and the nation state is the idea that capitalism needs nationalism, it needs a form of national identification, national consciousness, in order to reassure its kind of reproduction, because it binds the working class to the ruling class. It overcomes an inherent class antagonism within that mode of production, which Neil says is part of a mediated totality. So I look at you point of view, um, which I actually don't, don't agree with. I don't agree with kind of seeing the world as a media totality and actually take the opposite point that um, Neil uh, plays off against in this chapter where he talks about the idea of structure and dominance. So that's actually what I would say, that we have a, the creation of capitalist value, which is competitive, generates effects, is dominant over them, but it doesn't need them in the sense that a washing machine needs electricity. So if you take the plug out of a wash, uh, the unplug a washing machine, obviously it stops. I'm not so sure we can posit a similar kind of, I'm sure you wouldn't make such a simplistic argument, but I don't think we can treat capitalism as a similar entity. And I would say, of course, you all know that south of our growth, nobody believes Lucasian approaches <laughs> uh, to the social world, so this wouldn't be a surprise. But basically, when capitalism is said to need something, what is it that's doing the needing? Because we know it's not individual capitals. Right? We know it's not individual kind of state managers. So I'd say I'm not sure that's the right, that's the right framework. Particularly because that then makes it difficult to derive explanations at the same level that the question is posed. So the question, or the, let's say capitalism's needs in the argument, are at a philosophical and logical level. 
So basically, Neil posed a kind of thought experiment. Um, if this, then that. And if it wasn't that way, that would necessarily happen. Which is, I'm not disagreeing with doing that. That's perfectly valid. Uh, but then the answers that come to say this is what does what's required are at a historical and social level. So they are nationalism, particular content, right? particular sets of ideas in actually existing people's heads. Why those ones? Why not other ones? I mean, Neil's kind of said you, you can't imagine people identifying with supranational bodies like the EU. Yeah, fair enough, because it's a particularly unpleasant supranational <laughs> body. But it's conceivable that they might, with others, it's happened before, people identified with pre-modern empires, at least certain sections of the population did. And I would actually say, I think there is more of a degree of identification with the enterprise that one, especially, God, if you work in a university, the degree of identification with the employers is horrible. It's incredible how people just take their interests as, as, as their own. But I think it actually extends quite far into the labour movement that that happens. So I'm not, I, don't, I don't I think that that's too easily dismissed, basically. And therefore, that the argument that nationalism is doing a job for capitalism is a bit unstable. Um, <clears throat> which, you know, leads me just to take, I was going to talk a bit about Nazism, but we can maybe do that in the, hear more about it in the discussion. But, for example, the Iraq war case, which I think was an imperialist war, and I think the, expla the concrete explanation we gave, I largely agree with. But, in terms of the rationality of capital that you use in the chapter, would it have been just as rational for the US not to invade Iraq? Because we're talking about concrete events, you're providing historical explanations, but on the basis of a philosophical or logical um, kind of lack or absence. So that's the main thing I wanted to really challenge about. But then there were a couple of other things that was an invitation to talk more about. So it the, the, the essays start off with that, as I say, quite, I mean, for me, quite formative one about the concept of ethnicity. And that's already got you know, 16, 17 years ago. And things have changed to come around a bit so that now, particularly on the student left, but also wider academic circles, certainly, identity is a master category of politics. And resistance to oppression is seen through lenses of identity. And two kind of uh, categories identity and privilege, basically, are the master ones at the moment. And I'd just like to know if you could extrapolate some of the stuff that you said in that essay, perhaps to discuss how one navigates that terrain without appearing or not, without dismissing things and being kind of saying, oh, gender doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, being trans doesn't matter. That's not, you know, viable as a form of socialist politics, I think. Um, <clears throat> And finally, to, I mean, we've talked quite a lot about the Brexit or the EU issue, and I would want to, I don't know, it's not a question, it's just a pure denunciation, but I think, you, so you, you're right to point to the, the distinction you made about the Scottish referendum and the tools that people have to hopefully guard against the mobilisation of national consciousness into nationalism. But do you really see that that's possible within the, the, the Brexit debate because, I mean, I personally, just personally, politically, with other people, would say that actually the whole, the whole thing's a carnival of reaction and to, partic to intervene into it actually is, um, th there's no gain, basically, for socialists on, on either side of this Brexit debate now. I'm not saying the EU is to be identified with, I mean, the degree of identification with <coughs> A fundamentally neoliberal outfit is it's astonishing, but that's the problem of the debate. It starts to force people who ought to be taking an independent left-wing position to say, oh, I defend the EU because it's about the Enlightenment, because it's about universal values. And then on the other side, leading to people, I'm not saying that people in that kind of organised left are necessarily doing this, but as we've heard, bits of, bits of the labour movement are, who are part of left leave are arguing, oh, we're not racist, 
But we need immigration controls because of the pressure on services and ordinary people understand this. The only people who are for open borders are you pointy heads kind of thing. So when you get into that, the, pull, the, the logic of a debate in which you are a tiny fraction tends to actually pull you further apart in a bad way. So I just want them, we can basically open up that discussion as well. Let's see. Thank you, Jamie. Um, well, that's a lot of food for thought, isn't it? So hopefully you've been thinking and have points that you would like to make or questions. So just stick the hands up and I'll call upon you. Absolutely.